The Bible says that these signs in the heavens are so great that all of the rulers on the earth are going to flee. And they're going to beg to have the mountains fall on them. Tonight we are in Revelation chapter 6, beginning there in verse 9, down through the end of the chapter, verse 17. And if you will remember from last week, this is a continuation of the entirety of chapter 6. Chapter 4 and chapter 5 is an interesting scene there in Revelation as in chapter 4 we saw a scene of God Almighty seated there on his throne in the heavenlies in the throne room of heaven and to his sides are the four living creatures representing all of creation and then around the throne there are seated there the 24 elders and they worship day and night and they fall before their are fa- on their face before God Almighty and they worship him Lord Almighty the creator of the heavens and the earth and then in chapter 5 we see a new character introduced not to the book but to the scene and that new character introduced to the scene there is Jesus himself though in the text he's referred to as the lamb more specifically he is the lamb who is worthy and you remember that John became distraught he was in despair because he had seen a scroll in the right hand of the Lord Lord Almighty as he sat there on his throne he saw a scroll and he began to weep and he began to be in despair because there was no one in heaven on earth or under the earth that was worthy to take the scroll and we know that scroll as the Lord continues to unravel that that is the unveiling of the future it is as some have said it's the the title or the deed to the universe it is the deed to the sovereignty over all of the universe and just John's weeping there he's told weep no longer for the lamb who was slain is worthy he's worthy to receive power and wealth and riches and glory and praise and honor and so the lamb goes there to God Almighty seated on the throne and he takes that scroll and the scroll is an interesting uh, ornament there on its outside it is sealed with seven seals And in order for that scroll to be opened all of the way, those seven seals must be broken. So in order for the future to take place, in order for the universe, as it were, to come unraveled and then to be put in its rightful place, those seven seals have to be broken. Now, as we look in chapter 6, chapter 6 and 7 actually are the breaking of those seven seals. Chapter 6 is the breaking of the first six seals. And as I've argued with you last week, I'll say it again this week, and I'll package it a little bit differently. When you think of the apocalyptic, and when I say apocalyptic, uh, make no mistake, all I'm referring to is end times type literature. I'm talking about end times revelation. And so you actually have apocalyptic texts all through the Bible. You have them in Isaiah and the Psalms and Daniel and Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Malachi, uh, Haggai. You have them in all of the Gospels minus the Gospel of John. You have them in the Synoptic Gospels. You have some of these passages in 1 Corinthians 15, 2 Thessalonians 1, 1 Thessalonians 4. And then you have these texts right here in the book of Revelation. Now, the three texts in the Synoptic Gospels, that's the Gospels that are alike, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you each have a passage, or a passage in each one of those books. You have Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. And in each one of those chapters, Jesus is unfolding the future there for his disciples. And the key to understanding this, I say the key, as if there's just one key, honor God's word, that's the key. But the key to understanding this, in, in, in my mind's eye, my heart as I study God's word is to understand that Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, those are very broad overviews of the way that the end times unfold. They're very broad, they're very compact, they're very succinct. Jesus reveals the future to his disciples, the end of all things, the end of the age, but he doesn't do it in great detail. 
He gives them some of the detail. The nations are going to start rising up against one another. You hear of wars and rumors of wars, and you'll experience tribulation unlike any other time in all of the world from its beginning and even to the end. This will be the period of great tribulation. You'll see signs in the heavens. The moon be turned to blood. The sun will not give its light. The stars are going to fall. And then you'll see the sign of the Son of Man in the skies, and then you will see the Son of Man coming on clouds and with great glory. What I just explained to you from those three passages there in the Gospels is the entirety. It is the entirety of what you read there in Revelation 6 all the way to chapter 20. And then in chapter 21, you have the resurrection of the dead and the millennial reign there, the second coming of Christ. In Revelation 19, you have the white rider who is Jesus who returns and he slaughters the enemies of God and sets up his kingdom. So in Revelation chapter 6, what I'll argue with you is just as in those three gospel texts, they give you a broad overview, Revelation 6 and 7 give you a broad overview. They give you a broad overview of the rest of the book. Though it's not as broad, it's not as succinct, it's not as compact as Jesus' revelation there in those three gospel texts. It is a little more detailed, and so you're able to see how these events unfold. Rather, you're able to see how these times are characterized. So as we look last week there in chapter 6, remember that what John is seeing here, he's told there in chapter 4, come up here and see the things that are going to take place after these things. In chapter 6, verse 1 through 2, you see this first rider. He's riding, riding a white horse, and he is given authority. He has a bow, and he has a crown. These things were given to him by God. And he came conquering and to conquer. You're going to have great kingdoms. As the end comes to a close, you're going to have great kingdoms on the earth. You're going to have conquerors who come conquering, and they do succeed in that. You will have great nations ruling over the earth. But that's not all that the end times are characterized by. Secondly, the second seal is broken, and there's another horse that is sent out from heaven. I've argued with you from Zechariah uh, chapter 2 and Zechariah chapter 6. Six, that I believe that these horses and riders represent angels, angels that are carrying out God's plan in the earth. It doesn't fit, we don't have time to explain it, it doesn't fit to say that that white horse is the Antichrist because then you have to answer the question, who are the other horses? So it just doesn't fit. What fits is this, that this is God's unfolding of the events taking place. It's his angels carrying forth God's purpose as it describes there in Zechariah. So not only are you going to have kingdoms, great kingdoms on the earth, but in, in verses 3 through 4 of chapter 6, you see a, another horse, a red horse. And the rider on it is given the authority to take peace from the earth. He takes peace from the earth, and you have people slaying one another. You have mass world wars. You have mass casualties. I gave you this figure last week and then again on Sunday that in the 20th century alone, 163 million people have been killed in wars just in that span, that single span of 100 years, 163 million people. The third seal, the third unveiling of the future, a portion of the future, this rider that's let loose, he's riding on a black horse, and he's given authority to affect economic issues such that there is great famine in the world, that a day's worth of labor won't even feed a man a full stomach worth of bread, okay? There's great economic catastrophe in this world. I don't have to explain much of our current events to tell you what's going on in our world today. The fourth seal, you see this strange horse, this sickly, pale, yellowish. The word there is actually where we get our word for chlorophyll. And you have this yellowish, green, pale horse, a, a sick horse, and he is let loose. And it says that his name was Death, the rider's name was Death, and Hades, or Hell, followed after him. And he's given authority over the, a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, famine, pestilence, and the wild beasts of the earth. So you're going to have mass numbers of death in this world by all sorts of means. 
It seems like every week we have a a new disease that pops up on the radar that everybody is fearful of and frets over and goes and gets shots and the shots don't work. I'm going to get this disease. I'm going to die anyway. And you have people so fearful and terrified of the things that are coming. And you have people all over the world dying of these pestilences. In the 20th century, you had 40 million people die of famine just because they couldn't get another bite of bread. The way the Bible describes these things is that these things are going to get worse and worse as we get closer and closer to that great and terrible day of the Lord when Jesus returns. Now, our text comes right here in chapter 6, verse 9. You see the fifth seal that is opening what is the fifth way that these end times the times at the close of the age what is it going to be characterized by well he begins there in in verse 9 of chapter 6 when he that's Jesus the lamb who was worthy God is sovereign over the whole future so the things that we have read they've seemed very chaotic but they're not chaotic at all they're ordered they're absolutely ordered they're controlled They're absolutely controlled because we serve a God who is unfolding the future, who has absolute control over all things. So when things go chaotic in your life, understand, they're not chaotic to God. God is orchestrating these things. And if you are a believer in God, you are called in Christ, the Bible tells you that God is working together all of those things for your good. They're not chaotic. They're God's plan. So when he, the lamb, verse 9, Jesus opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness that they had borne. Some call this seal the seal of the martyrs. The end of all things, the end of the age is going to continue to escalate to be an age of the martyrs. Those who have died for their testimony, that word witness there at the end of verse 9 is the Greek word martyrion, which is where we get our word martyr. It means testimony, someone who is bearing the testimony, bearing the word of God on their lips in their life, and they end up dying for it. Now, something that's very interesting about the the breaking of this seal, it says, I saw, John says, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God. What's interesting is the location here. Obviously, he's speaking figuratively. Those souls are in heaven with God. It's appointed for man once to die. After that, the judgment. So they go to God. They are with God. But in John's vision, he sees under God's altar. Now, I'll ask you a question. What was an altar for? What is the altar for in the temple of God? It's for sacrifice. The gifts that are brought to God are put at the altar. Some of these gifts are brought and they're put at the feet of the altar. You get the picture here? That those who give their life in this great tribulation period, in the time that we live in, from the time, understand this, that for Jesus and his disciples, the end of the age began at Jesus' ascension. That was the end of the age. A passage I'm going to read here in just a minute from Joel chapter 2 signifies to us that the coming of the Holy Spirit signified the end of the age. For Jesus and onward, that is the end of the age. These are the days of great trial. These are the days of great tribulation. And those who are slain on this earth for their testimony for God are under the altar of God. They are a gift to the Lord. Understand this, Christian, that there is no act of service that you as a believer do for the Lord. There's no act of service that you do for the Lord that goes forgotten. It does not go forgotten. 
Those who are slain for the Lord in times past, in years past, they have not been forgotten. They have not been lost. They are not buried and gone. Their sacrifice has not gone up into the wind. It is there before God, and he is ever mindful of the things that people have sacrificed for him. And most importantly, he is ever mindful of those who have given their life for his name. So don't think for one moment that the things that you sacrifice sacrifice in this life and if you're called upon at some point in your life in your mortal life to give your life for the Lord it will not be in vain it will be remembered before the Lord as an offering as a a gift what more could we as Christians do for the Lord that gave his life for us what more could we do we deserve death Jesus didn't deserve death. The least that we could do is give our life for his name. I would find it interesting, though, that I think most people in this world who identify themselves as Christian would like to include themselves in that number someday. They would like to think That if they were called upon to die for the Lord, if they were called upon to die for the name of Christ, that they would. I think that many people who claim to be Christians would like to be qualified in that number, thinking that they would give their life for the Lord. I would contend with you this, that if a person is not willing to live for Jesus, they're not going to be willing to die for Jesus. If a person is not willing to live for Jesus, they are not going to be willing to die for Jesus. They're going to be like that person who in the beginning, Jesus said, any man who wants to come after me must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That place of death, it's going to cost you your life. Anyone who wants to save their life is going to lose it. Anyone who will lose their life for my sake will find it. You know the cost here. I think that many people fall into the category of that man who begins to build the building. He begins to follow Jesus and says, Jesus, I'll live for you, but the cost of the building becomes too great he's unwilling to pay it and he has a half finished home because when it comes time to give his life for the Lord he's not willing to pay that price most of the time people aren't willing to pay much lesser prices than that living for the Lord is a much lesser price to pay than dying for the Lord if you're not willing to live for Jesus hard to believe that you would be willing to die for Jesus So this is a call for me to examine my heart. It's one thing to preach words. It's one thing to formulate sermons. It's one thing to lead a church. But what about if somebody had a knife to my throat? Would I witness for Christ at that point? I'd pray for God's grace that I'd be able to. But I will make certain of this. I will make certain that I'm going to live for the Lord so that if that time comes when I'm called to die for the Lord, I will. Faith that is not lived out is hardly a faith worth dying for. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? I think the key to their peace is understanding what they mean by sovereign when they call the Lord despotes when they call him their absolute master who holds sovereign sway over them and over all things, I believe that that is where we and other believers are to find our peace. 
Understanding that God has all of these things in control. Understanding that these things are part of God's plan. Remember that Jesus prophesied these things. Matthew 24, verse 9, one of the texts that I alluded to earlier. Matthew 24, 9. Then he tells his disciples, they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all, by all nations for my name's sake. You should expect this, disciple of Christ. You should expect to be hated in this world. Moreover, Jesus says in John 15, 21, but all these things they will do to you on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. Because Jesus is the sovereign Lord, he's told us that these things are going to come. So when they happen, take comfort in that. So their prayer is, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? As we've been studying the Old Testament survey class and our Sunday night ser seminary series, I've been very pleased and delighted to see all of the parallels in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And when I read this prayer of the martyrs, read this prayer of the saints whose souls are under the altar of God, I can't help but reminisce to Israel's cry when they were in bondage in Egypt. It says this in Exodus 2, 23 and 25. During those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. And just as Jesus was faithful to rescue his people out of Egypt, God will also remember his people who die for him, who give their life in this world. Luke 18, 7 through 8, Jesus says, and will not God Give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night. Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. According to the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, they estimate that an average, an average of 180 Christians are killed explicitly for their faith each month in this world. 180 Christians killed for the testimony of the Lord, the testimony of Jesus. They're not just dying in some nationalistic war or some feud between two sects. These people have guns pointed to their head and they're asked, will you renounce the name of Christ? And they say no and they're killed or they're decapitated in some form or fashion. They are put to death. An estimated 180 Christians per month die that death. In the 20th century, mind you, I told you about that red horse and its rider who's given authority to take peace from the earth. 163 million died in war in the 20th century. In the 20th century alone, more Christians have been martyred for their faith than in all of the previous centuries till Christ combined. It's an estimated 70 million Christians have been put to death since Christ ascended into heaven. In the 20th century alone, they estimate 42 and a half million in the 20th century alone. Things seem to be getting worse and worse and spiraling not out of control, but perfectly in God's control as he has predicted. So listen to what he tells the saints who have gone before us, some of whom we will join, and those who come after us if they give their life for the Lord. Verse 11 of chapter 6, Then they were each given a white robe. These are, the, these are the clothings, the garments of those who are pure, those who have been washed in forgiveness by the blood of Jesus. They were each given a white robe. They are sealed for God and told to rest a little longer until until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been 
in Jesus' revelation of these things to the Apostle John, he tells him that the martyrdom of Christians is not going to stop with these beginning numbers who die. There is a full number, there is a full quota, there is an exact number of Christians that are going to give their life in the name of Jesus before those days are over. Just as there are an exact number of Gentiles who are going to come in to the fullness of gen the Gentiles, there's an exact number of the Jews who are going to come in to the fold and then the end will come. God knows every single person who will give their life for him. In fact, the Bible tells us, Jesus says, don't worry, your heavenly Father knows every single hair on your head. And he says, until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete. Chapter 6, verse 12, this sixth seal is mentioned there in Matthew 24, verse 29 through 31, though not the whole verse of 31, because the end of 31 tells us that after these signs in this sixth seal, after these signs take place, that Jesus is going to come. But there's a little bit of a gap in here, and I'll I'll show you that. So let's look at verse 12. When he, that's Jesus, opened the sixth seal. I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, mega seismos. It's not necessarily talking about seismic activity where the tectonic plates collide and you have mountains falling and growing and islands being swallowed. It very well probably refers to that, but it seems from the text here that it can refer to a whole greater experience than just seismic activity. It literally says this, when he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a, a great shaking. And the reason I say that this is not just a shaking of the tectonic plates that our continents rest on is because there are things that happen in the heavenlies. This earthquake is so great that the very heavens are shaken. Now, you can be guaranteed we have not seen this seal. You can be guaranteed of that. We have not seen this seal unfold yet. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a, a great shaking, a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth. Surely we do see eclipses, but we have not seen the sun turn black as sackcloth where it gives no more light. It's covered in the garments or in the colorings there of mourning. And it's specific here that it would be black as sackcloth because this signifies a a time of mourning. They are going to mourn because the great and terrible day of the Lord is coming. These are signs that are so great in the heavens. This is why I say that this sixth seal has not taken place yet because the Bible says that these signs in the heavens are so great that all of the rulers on the earth are going to flee and they're going to beg to have the mountains fall on them. It says, the sun became black as sackcloth, the garments of mourning there. It's dark, pitch dark. The full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit and shaken by a gale. That must be a mega shaking, not just of the earth, but of the universe. That the earth is shaken so hard that the sun no longer gives its light, the moon looks like blood, and the stars are cast down to the earth. A great meteor shower, as it were. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll. That word vanished there literally means it is torn or it is separated. It's as if you were to unroll a scroll and you were to tear it in the middle and then it were to roll back on itself in two distinct parts. There's going to be a gaping hole there in the sky. And I would contend with you from the rest of the book of Revelation that that renting of the sky is the gap in which Jesus enters the earth. 
The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. The most stable places on the earth, they are removed. You see a pattern of this in Scripture, don't you? That the things that we think of in the earth as being most stable, most glorious, most magnificent, they don't stand a chance in God's wake. You remember the words of Jesus that we've been studying in Luke 21 about the temple as the disciples are marveling about the magnificence of the temple. And Jesus says, I tell you the days are coming when not one stone will be left upon another. The most magnificent structures built by men will not withstand the judgment of God. And moreover, the most magnificent and strong structures built by God on earth will not withstand the judgment of God. With that being said, you can understand the reaction that all of the mighty people, even the freemen and the slaves have here in a moment. Verse 15 says, Then... The kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free. He pretty much just lists everybody that could exist. No matter what power structure, wealth structure, no matter what economic status or stratus you are in, you will fear this great and terrible day of the Lord. Rather, the people of the earth will fear it when they see these signs here in the heavens. Slave and free, everyone hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us. Can you imagine desiring that? Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? I'm not one of those who believes that it's wrong to tell people that you ought to run from God because you're running from hell. I'm not one of those people that would say that. Some people like to be lovey and mushy and gushy and say, well, you should just run to God because you love God. Well, you should, but you should also run from hell because hell is hell. You should also run from hell because it's the judgment of God. You see the reaction of even the most powerful people on the planet, not at seeing the face of him who is to judge them, but seeing the signs of his coming, just the signs of his coming, and they want mountains to fall on their head. That tells me this, anything Anything is better than enduring the judgment of God. Anything. Anything you could go through in this life, any amount of suffering that you would be called to suffer for the name of Christ, for the cause of Christ, anything is better than having to endure the judgment of Christ. Because just as these people say, who can stand? No one can endure the judgment of God. So these people run and they fear. I will argue this with you that chapter 7 is a direct result of these great signs that occur in heaven. They're in the heavens. The shaking of the earth. The stars falling to the sky, the moon turning to blood, the sun turning black as sackcloth. I would argue with you this. That when the nation of Israel sees these signs, and when the people of the earth see these signs, that the Jews will find that there is a mass awakening to faith in Christ. Well, there will be many who will be terrified and they will run in fear. But I would argue with you that chapter 7 is a direct result, the sealing of the 144,000 of the Jews. It is a direct result of them seeing these great signs. Now, if you read Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, what you read is that these great signs happen and then you have the coming of the Lord. But I'll contend with you that the coming of the Lord does not immediately follow those great signs. 
There is a time period between these signs that we see in the heavens, the great shaking of the earth, the stars falling to the earth. There is a time period between that and the coming of the Lord. And I'll point you just to one passage. You can see me after the service. I'll give you about seven of them if you'd like. But I'll point you to one passage here in Joel chapter 2, verse 30 through 32, to explain what I'm saying. But there is a period of time between the great signs of heaven and the return of the Lord. Joel chapter 2, verse 30. God says, And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. When, Joel? Before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass. Notice what he says is the result of these great signs that come before the return of the Lord. In verse 32 of Joel 2, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Many will come to Christ as a direct result of seeing these great signs in the heavens. You see how even in the disastrous events they're going to unfold and that are going to come upon the earth, that the Lord in the end offers the world a hope of grace shows them these great and terrible signs after these wars and famines and earthquakes and terrible pestilences. God gives people an opportunity to see these signs and to repent. But the Bible tells us in the rest of Revelation that there are many people that see these bowls of wrath that are poured out by these angels and they refuse to repent. Paralleled to the exact reaction that Pharaoh had in Egypt. How he saw sign after sign after sign, and yet he hardened his heart, and he refused to repent. But not all people will have their heart hardened. Believer. Each week as we've looked at these things, as I begin to finish the sermon, I feel this weight I, I see your faces and I see the weight on you saying, man, that's a lot to take in. Man, those are some terrible things that are going to take place. But I'll tell you the same thing that the Bible tells all of us. Fear not. If your faith is in Christ, you know, just as those martyrs have said, that he is the sovereign Lord that these terrible things are his doing and those terrible things are the just recompense of all the terrible things that the world has done. And God is perfect in justice and he will right every wrong. Now, person here who, you're not following Jesus. And when you think about these things, you're terrified and you should be. Understand this. Anything is better than enduring the judgment of Christ. A mountain falling on your body is better. You can escape the judgment of Christ. You can be adopted into his family as a son, as a daughter, if you will, but place your life in his hands. And you will begin, even this moment, to follow after him and to be forgiven. Will you pray with me?